Okay, so just a heads up for this episode, we are talking about sexism, so just a trigger warning, I do talk about sexual harassment and um, sexual abuse and this does come up, so if you feel sensitive around this subject, maybe this is not the episode for you. And it's also the longest episode, so bear with us as we discuss a range of different things. I feel a bit uncomfortable about the first part of the conversation where we're discussing non-binary pronouns because I've heard from a lot of people that different people are comfortable with different things and as a cis person myself, I don't feel comfortable being the expert or like just saying anything definitively about this space. So while we have a discussion on um, non-binary people, please keep that in mind that this is just a conversation between two people who maybe aren't the most educated, but we are learning every single day and I just want to make sure we're all going in with that mindset. So um, brace yourself for this journey about sexism, including a random rant about weddings. Sorry about that, but let's just get straight into the episode. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of How to Conserve Conservationists. I'm Jesse. You're here with Todd. I'm and Todd. This is Todd. He's still Todd, in case you're wondering. He's not anyone else. <laughs> I haven't replaced you Imposter yet. Imposter Todd. <laughs> this chapter and episode is What's in Your Field Pants? Another great chapter title by me. Once again, I can only guess what this chapter is actually about. Underwear. No. Is it? It's about sexism in <laughs> conservation um, and being judged only because you're different in your field pants. so basically sexism is something that i've come across like a lot in the industry and i'm not even sure if it's more so than in other industries like certain parts of conservation are more male dominated but other parts are not like in my biodiversity and conservation degree it was mostly women there was like a lot of men still but it was like the majority of them would be women um so there's some parts of conservation that in like the environmental sector that are very heavily womanized <laughs> in my yeah if i picture a conservationist i picture a lady cuddling a koala that's like anti-conservation <laughs> what? that's yeah, harming like, the koala know. but um there's a lot of times in my industry where i have had negative experiences because of the the male people in my in my job and experiences <laughs> Um, Are you going to spill tea? Name names? I'm not going to name... I've never named names or spilled tea. I spilled that really bad tea in the last episode. About <laughs> that was not actually about a, any particular person that you named. Yeah, well, I don't want to start some drama. We don't want no drama. You know, I always tell people that I could make like a Women's Weekly or something about the conservation industry because I have connections. I know a lot of the drama that goes on. <laughs> and I'm very scared to slander anybody because one that's i'm not promoting that's not the like ethics or energy i want to promote in the industry i want everyone to uplift each other but there's something to say about speaking about what happens but not tearing anybody down you know like i'm all about education and not about like sitting the hairdresser and gossip (laughs) the more constructive type of thing instead of like Let's adopt cancel culture and try and get this one person fired for. Because I don't want to be cancelled. So like, yeah, someone might cancel you then. Yeah, don't cancel me. No cancel culture. Fair Have you then. been a perfect angel to everyone professionally in your career? Um. Well, I think <laughs> I don't let people walk all over me. And this is one example I talk about in the book where this guy. So I worked for um like a restoration um company. So we did like planting native plants around suburban areas in the city and we also did weed removal and stuff like chainsawing brush cutting i think here in melbourne they call them bush crew but we didn't use that term back in i believe it's like hardcore industrial scale gardening yeah exactly um so i was in a team purely of men like 100 percent men and i was this young girl that had like I was just coming back from Madagascar, I was still, I was like 20 or something, um, and a guy who was the team leader was like, oh, sweetie, you're tall, do you play netball? And I was like, you're short, do you play mini golf? 
And <laughs> because I made that comment, I didn't like I could only work in the casual like seasonal position. He did not keep me on year round. He did not like you. After I didn't that. know. I thought it was because like there was just not enough money and funds to have people on year round when it got too hot and the work got like reduced. But then the guy who started after me got kept on. Like I was working for like four or five weeks before he started and he got kept on the whole year. And I only found out a couple of seasons later because I became friends with some of the guys. They like talked to like the head of this company and he's like, oh, this guy complained because Jesse made this remark. I'm like, well, how come it's fair for him to continuously call me babe <laughs> um, to make comments about like, oh, you're tall. Do you play? I know if you're tall, you get these comments all the time, right? Yeah. But you have to be able to take it back. Like if you're just asking everyone, do you play at this specific sport because of this one attribute of your body, you must be able to take that comic that comment back. It, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, he's just trying to have some banter. In yeah. The office. Like, come on. So anyway, I found out like because I stood up for myself. I was not kept on, and it was a boys' club for the rest of the time. I've heard, like, it's a thing where if women are just, like, a normal level of assertiveness and, like, dishing out as much as they receive... Uh, you're bossy. It's, it's, yeah, it's perceived as, like, oh, you must be, like, really bitchy you're and bossy. You're bitchy, you're bossy. And I had to work five times as hard as any of those men to be considered as equal. Like, I was hauling olives yeah. with the best of them. I was like, we had this big fire pit, like we basically olives are like a pest species in the Adelaide Hills and they're like plaguing the area. Birds love to eat the olives, shit out their seeds and they're in all these like rocky terrains. So we're on basically like cliff edges, like cutting down olive trees, some guy would chainsaw them down, um, then they would be falling down the hill, we would have to lug them up the hill haul them into this big fire which like half of my hair singed off (laughs) and then we'd have to like drill and poison like the stumps to make sure they didn't grow but even then they're like feisty bitches and they would come back um so this is like hard yakka work like really that's very australian (laughs) it's very like tough work and for me to have to exert myself like five times more to be considered still equal or less than like i still didn't feel equal like, yeah. that is not fair. I would get home and I would nap. And then I would eat dinner and I would go to bed and then I would wake up in the morning. Like, I was either doing that or sleeping. Like, it just yeah. took everything out of me. Well, that's definitely a thing in, like, any male-dominated industry. Like, I know, like, in IT, for me, if you have a lady, it's not even, like, super outrageously on the nose, but, like, a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, what does she really know? She can't be, you know, as knowledgeable as, you know, the guys. Which is pretty effed up, right? Yeah, it's pretty bad. But, like, yeah, they do have to, like, extra prove themselves just because of people's stereotypes. And even the way that the people at your work talk about their partners. I'm like, why are you even with, like, why are you with a woman? Why are you in a relationship if you're going to talk about them like that? The old ball and chain. The misses. The misses. But, okay. That's really descriptive. I hate... The t- like prefixes. I hate misses. I hate Ms. Like, because apparently I didn't know this. Ms. Mm. just means that your partner died. Like, you're a widower. I'm not convinced that's true. I didn't think that I was true. I don't know the either. etymology of. Etymology. <laughs> what did I say? Entomology. Entomologist? That's like someone that studies bugs. Is it? <laughs> yeah. What's the one that studies words? Etymology. Etymology. Um, but Mrs. Tells everyone, I am in a relationship. I am married to a man. Yeah, there's a weird sort of, like, miss, missus. Men are just mister all the time, or master if they're, like, a child. Yeah. Like, their relationship status has no bearing on their identity. Yeah, which is so messed up. And the only way you can get out of it is to do a PhD and be a doctor. And I know, (laughs) like, this is a problem as well for non-binary people, where, like, you have to get a PhD to get a non-binary term. Yeah, otherwise... What do you, what do you, what can you call them? I'm not sure. I think there's ones using X's. I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want to say. Well, then you have like, yeah, it's the same as like uh, trying to be non-binary pronouns. It just sort of like, it goes against people's uses of English and other languages. And I think people just sort of recall from that. 
It depends how old it you makes are. You, it makes you stand out more mm. than you wanted to to begin with. I mean, there's some... Like, your stepdad, for instance, says, I don't get these non-binary prefixes, pronouns. I'm not using them. They're dumb. Blah, blah. Yeah. And then you probably have people in school at the moment. I have... I see a lot of people on TikTok, so hip, um, <laughs> that like, give out a list and they say, what is your name? What is your pronoun? Yeah. And some people are, like, in the midst of coming out or accepting themselves as non-binary or trans... They think it's great the teacher asked that, but they're still like they are pressured to label themselves as something mm. like that. You're putting the pressure on them, like tell me what you are when like they they don't know yet. And I think that's super pro- like progressive for the teacher to ask, but also that can put some people in a really vulnerable position where they have to either out themselves to everyone in their class or use a pronoun that they're not comfortable with. <laughs> it puts him on the spot a bit yeah so it's challenging and i think like hopefully things will get better so you as a straight cis woman are you allowed to complain about people hating you because of who you are yeah I, everyone, other people get it worse probably everyone though, right? can't like comparison is the thief of joy you should never compare yourself to anybody because your worst problem is still your worst problem and actually this this topic was really challenging for me to write about because I disclosed some really horrific things that have happened to me in the field from like when I was in Madagascar and one of the field staff walked up to me and just grabbed my ankles and split my legs apart and try to like take advantage of me when I was alone on camp looking after after like a ton of volunteers. Like I don't deserve that. Nobody deserves that. And the reason I talk about it, even though it's challenging to you, is because when I finally worked, like, I was never going to tell anybody on the camp, but then this guy lived on the camp with us. So he was, like, the local field staff, big African man, like, really strong. He was using a machete, cutting things down all the day, like, physical strength. I remember... Is this the guy that did it? Yeah. He, so we were, when this incident I happened... I would be intimidated by him. If you... <laughs> everyone would be. Man, woman, whatever you are, you would be scared. Okay. So basically, we were on a sat camp, like, we were on a different island when this happened. I was alone looking after this group of volunteers. When we went back to the camp, he still lived there. So he would come to my hut, and to the point where I was so scared, he would come to my door, I'd jump out my window. He would come to my window, I'd jump back in like a cat and mouse <laughs> game of Jesus. being chased around by this big burly guy. I eventually told the head of the camp, and I was like, look, this happened to me. What the hell? And he's like, "So I, I have to interrupt you. I will not hear another word of this unless it comes from the principal investigator, also a guy who was also on that camp, but was like leading a walk when this incident happened. I go to the principal. Why does he have to listen to him instead of the person it happened to? I know, ridiculous. I feel like he's following you off. Then I go to the principal investigator. Can you please talk to the boss about this? Oh, sorry. Um, I had a lot of administration issues when I got to the island and without this guy, couldn't have worked it out. So I'm not going to say anything bad about him. So the Well, that's, that's a very universal thing, right? The guy... It's always a guy, let's be honest. Yeah. Who's been... <laughs> <laughs> who's the aggressor is like, you know, in a powerful position in the, you know, organization, which for stupid reasons gives them protection. Yeah. So basically I went to the two most powerful people in the camp and they didn't give a shit about my health and well-being, my safety. And so I thought, why would anybody else care? And I was mm-hmm. like 21 at this stage. You're also, like, trapped on this island yeah. with, like, the same people. No um, Wi-Fi, no connection to the outside world. Like, I couldn't call or talk to anybody that wasn't on the island already. So, it, I was trapped there. Like, you couldn't even just call the police and have them take them away. <laughs> no. Like, that's just not even an option. No. So, this was... And we were on, like, an island off of the mainland. So, even, like... Well, this is, like... You're in a very vulnerable position to begin with. Exactly. So basically, I learned from that moment, as from a young age, that if anything happens to me, like if a man tries to take advantage of me, if he tries to manhandle me, if anything happens to me, nobody's going to care. Because my friend, like he was a volunteer and then a staff. Now he's my friend that lives in Victoria as well. He was like, 
he found out about it years later and he's like jesse i was on that camp why didn't you tell me and i was like if nobody else cared why would you care if you already told the people in charge yeah and they fob you off it's not going to leave you confident that people care at all yeah exactly so it's like this happens a lot in the industry and like one time even this i was in south africa and this norwegian guy he we were all at the pub and then he was somehow missing so it was mine and my friend's last day and we caught a taxi back to the volunteer house because we're like oh, we got to get on a plane early but he wasn't there when we left. Somebody found him, there was this whole search party. They eventually found him, they brought him back home. He was in bed and I was like, oh, I'm leaving tomorrow. I better like see how he is, like say goodbye, blah, blah. He was like sitting in this dark room, like pitch black room where there was two beds. He was in one bed. I wasn't, I like went and sat on the other bed over the other side of the room. And he must have been doing drugs or something. He was like very like not himself. Okay. He is talking very deep and slow in this thick Norwegian accent, which I cannot replicate and it haunts <laughs> me to this day and I will not. And I couldn't hear him. And he, so I, I went closer to him to understand what he was saying. And then he just, I remember him comparing me to a piece of meat saying like, you're like a steak on the barbecue or something, like something really ridiculous. And then he the makes compliment that did him not pay off. explicitly saying, I'm going to rape you now. I ran out of the room to where my friend and in the last episode I talked about hooking my friend up with this guy that they're now married they were still in the midst of young love (laughs) and I was like guys this just happened to me the guy was like oh my god girls come into the room like I will protect you he took us into our room he locked the door and he stayed with us but then he went outside to like see what was happening see what was up with this guy my friend said to me my best friend at the time we travelled to three different countries very close she said, how dare you, how dare you make this up to take, like, to, to split us up? To, You're really killing the vibe they had? Jeez. How dare you? How dare this happen to you? Yeah, how dare this happen to you that you make me stop my canoodling <laughs> <laughs> and come in here with you? And I was like, what the hell? Because she's a woman. She was my best friend at the time. Yeah. And she thought I was being, like, the problem. Thankfully, like, the guy she was with incredible handled the situation amazingly was did not have her attitude yeah but i was, i couldn't believe it like she was Sounds supposed like, to be uh... my best friend and she was also a girl like she was also you would have imagined could understand what it's like to be in a compromised situation there's probably like you know a large portion of women who just l- luckily knock on wood haven't been in a similar situation and have trouble relating just like a lot of guys do it's so interesting because like i remember at christmas one year a few friends were around we were playing scrabble and i was kind of talking about this and my friend As you do, my scrabble. friend was who's a guy i was like i never knew women would go through this what the hell like he made a conscious effort that day to like understand mm. what women go through walk on the other side of the street at night just change like little behaviors to make the people around him feel more comfortable yeah and then the other girl I was with was like, as if these things happened to you. Like, and I couldn't believe that she'd lived until she was like 21 and not experienced any of this. Cause it was like a constant battle for me. Yeah. Like job after job after job being disrespected or having to try harder or being put at a disadvantage because of the body I was born in. Yeah. Like what the hell? It That's... makes me so mad. For some reason, if I imagine, like, the stereotypical person who's complaining, like, oh, you know, you only get this attention because you dress slowly or something, I always picture, like, some old lady saying that. Weird. It's weird, though, right? Yeah. It's It's, weird. Like, it's too outrageous for a guy to say. What do you mean? Like, they're the ones saying it. For some reason, I picture a lady. I remember, speaking of women. (laughs) Speaking of women. When I worked at, like, a retail store, just, uh, like, bits and bobs, like, gadgets and stuff, this, like, old older lady was, like, helped her out, like, oh, you need this, oh, yeah, get this, oh, this will work with your thing, oh, sweet, yep, okay, sort it out. And as I was, like, ringing up her bill, she just, out of nowhere, was like, oh, man, I can't believe feminists nowadays. What the hell? I was like, yeah, you know, well, you know, it it means different things to different people, doesn't it? You know, everyone's got their own you know view of it 
sometimes they clash and she's like yeah we should should never have given women the right to vote what the hell? And i was like whoa, whoa okay lady <laughs> it's weird because i've had to learn a lot about like how women get internalized misogyny as well that's what it is right yeah and i had it for a long time because even like i would be proud to be like oh i'm a misogynist like screw women yeah because like this is what culture is like there's this systemic pressure to put women down that even women have it inside of them yeah. and it takes a long time to unlearn it like we always i don't know if todd can relate because he's a man <laughs> but like when i was a kid at school it was like cool to be friends with the guys to be one of the guys like it was i'm not like the other girls like yeah that's I've saying, heard that phrase. that's saying that the other girls are shit yeah like it doesn't matter which kind of girl you are being like a normal girl is seen as being a bad stupid person yeah like how ridiculous like this narrative has to change and it also is like kind of the responsibility of women to recognize their internalized misogyny and to kind of overcome that because by perpetuating it and being proud of being one of the boys and small like behaviors or things that you say mm. that has huge impacts for the permission you're giving other people to treat you and others around you yeah because like in being one of the guys quote unquote i've seen guys like treat women badly and i just accepted that as a norm like they would drive in their car and like wolf whistle like they would check people out objectify women talk about them as like oh i got with her last night but like she's hotter blah blah like, by being, like, it's like I'm accomplice. Like, I am partially responsible because mm. I was there supporting that behavior. And at what, like, my relationships with these men continued until that happened to me or until that happened to somebody I knew and cared about. When it happened to the yeah. other women, I didn't, like, I just tolerated it until it happened to someone I respected. And that's He would tell you about, like, oh, man, I got with this dumb slut last night. Oh, Never gonna get with her again. You'd be like, ha ha. <laughs> but then, like, when you knew the person, you're like, wait a second. Yeah. That's a friend I care about. How dare you speak that way about anyone now that I think about it? Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous how much I personally tolerated when, if that behavior was being done to me, very detrimental and very, like, I wouldn't stand for it. Yeah. And I, that's totally why women, like, firstly, the fear of the men's power as well is like, it, like so I was scared of the strength of this African guy then I was powerless in doing anything about it because nobody cared there's like so many layers of like how we are so powerless and how nothing can be done but imagine having a view that you carry inside that it's your fault and you are the weak agenda and you are like every like we are the girl we're not the other girl we are the dumb bitch that's like oh, that's not a useful attitude to have is it like we're doomed <laughs> like the fact that it's like so internalized as well like it's it sets us up for failure almost like we have to fight so hard to get wherever we want to go yep well the only other story i was going to bring up in a different industry because apparently that's my job in this yeah <laughs> podcast not even you know being sexually assaulted we had a um lady lady engineer uh come to us in uni mm -hmm. talking about like the problems she faced and like it was cool that the uni was like you know this is 2009 so like i guess before a lot of the sort of social justice became popular but she was like hey guys uh i know you're all uni students and like everyone in this uni uh course is a guy because that's just engineering she's like but like you know there are women and like please learn now to respect them because she will go to like a meeting of like all different engineers for a different project she walk into the room and every single other engineer is a guy and they're like oh hey honey uh can you get us a few coffees they think that she's you know just a secretary yeah. to get coffees not like also an engineer I actually... so like just little things like that is like fairly you know i don't think any of the guys like hate women or you know don't respect women engineers but like just that sort of that cultural stereotype is pretty you know messed up anyway i love those stories where it's like oh, hey honey can you get me a coffee or like you abuse someone on the way to work and then you find out they're interviewing you 
Like you, you <laughs> assumed in the elevator, <laughs> you assumed at the cafe that there was a subordinate. Then you get to your interview and they are the one making the decision about your future. Like, oh, best stories. I saw a, a tweet or like a, oh, every LinkedIn uh, comment, what do they call in <laughs> LinkedIn? Post. Status post is like, oh man, I was like going to a job interview, but then I saw this dog on the street that was homeless, so I stopped to feed it and like missed out on my job interview, but then I went, called him later, and I got it the next day, and it turns out the person giving me the interview was the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, make sure you treat everyone with kindness. Mocking, mocking the story. <laughs> Well, I just like to see people get put in their place sometimes because, like, I have seen all the ways in, like, you have had so much privilege, just especially in Indonesia. We've talked about this a lot where you didn't have half the stress, half the worries that I did. Like, I blatantly yeah. see this. And it's interesting because we have a friend that transitioned from female to male, and he has actually been able to see male privilege, like, be except like start getting first hand experience given to him yeah yeah and he's looking around like is anybody seeing this like what the hell like yeah. why is nobody talking about this because it's like night and day when he started experiencing it yeah. and i just think like this needs to be widely talked about i feel like i don't want to say it's transgender people's responsibility to educate cisgender people like that's not what it is at all but i think having people who have experienced both genders and can blatantly say that they get treated differently depending on how they present like that is so important for society to acknowledge that this is a thing that happens and it's not just in one gender's brain you know yeah. like that's so crazy to me how like night and day it was like even in the shops or like the people randoms will treat you differently or like people at work will give you more responsibility like you hold heavier objects like here have the chainsaw where before they'll be like I'll go weave this patch of grass. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, like, I had to put this chapter in because so much of my life has been, like, the biggest concerns with conservation have been sexism. Like, even, so I went through this incubator program, I've talked about it before, where I did, um, like, try to turn lonely conservationists into a business. Mm. I eventually got this opportunity to go consult for somebody and like um, assess their agricultural land to see um, like how economic like ecologically good or bad it was so they could adjust the environment to like make it better so yeah. I had an entomologist with me who was a guy um, one who studies words <laughs> yeah he was out looking at bugs and I was there looking at birds who were doing a surveys on the last day, uh, I asked a question to one of the, the staff at who were running the whole operation. And I was like, oh, so when we finish this report, do I email it to this person? And he's like, just email it to me. You won't seem like a bitch or anything. Just do it. And like <laughs> the entomologist was like, what the hell? We're, we're in the car. Like, this is not normal, right? It's a weird thing to say. Like, I, if I ask, should I send an email to this person? Mm. There should be no world where somebody will say that I could be even slightly considered to look like a bitch. Yeah. If they were talking to you, that would not be a conversation they would have. Like that would that would not come out of their brain. Like and the problem is, it's so normalized to me <sighs> that I was just like, "Oh, yeah, okay, good. I was worried about that." Like <laughs> trying yeah. to like change my actions to normalize their behavior when inside my alarm bells are going off like this is not normal. So, yeah. Something like that is even, like, a little bit subtle. Like, maybe if he was talking to a guy, he'd be like, oh, just do that, you won't look like a dick. Like, mm. may, you, maybe, right? Like it's a little bit words. subtle, right? I don't... Th I think if you're like, should I email... Even, like, the, just I, using the word bitch is already a bit of a sign. I think if you were like, should I email this guy? He'll be like, yeah, man, just chuck him an email. Be right. Yeah. She'll be right. She'll be right. And so I was like, no, this is not acceptable. I am representing Lonely Conservationists, an organization that is trying to make people more comfortable, have more respect, more value, more opportunities in the field. That's why I'm going through this and doing this. Um, I went to the CEO and sat in a meeting room and I was like, I've been treated like this. Basically, um, they're just like, all they said was you're brave for talking about it. <laughs> 
which I think is dumb for starters like I'm not brave I should be able to say like look your staff are not treating me right I deserve better than this I shouldn't be considered brave for doing that it should be like if you went and said I have a complaint would they say you're brave that's like when they say when chubby when chubby women post pictures in a bikini you're so brave (laughs) like if you were skinny nobody's saying you're brave for posting a picture in a bikini like it's so degrading to be like you're brave for doing this you're sort of uh you're bringing it up indirectly honey he's it's like the shock of like i can't believe you're bringing this up most people just slide it under the rug and then I, I know i do that at work it's mostly guys at my work and you know when you have a bunch of guys chatting with each other sometimes you know talk gets a bit rowdy and for me it, it's a bit of like a subtle spectrum of like if they say something really really obviously nasty i'll call them out on it like I'm okay with being. But that you guy have a at tolerate work. a toleration. But like, movement. yeah. At what level? If you know, if they say, if they just use the word "bitch" to describe someone, you're not calling them out every single. I'm day. not going to say like, how dare you use that word? You know, because they're a woman, you should say they're a dick. Like you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't be bothered calling out every single little. But like that's what it does all add up, right? Yeah. Into if, a culture if, if of if you keep saying if you keep letting it slide, like that's acceptable and they say like that's that person's a bitch every time they talk to you, then that's you're approving that language used by not saying anything. And I know Yeah, I definitely feel like that's what I'm doing. There's I talk like I talk about this in the book as well, how I've realized there's a toxic masculinity that impacts men. Like there might be this male pressure, social pressure for you to be like one of the boys. And by calling out every single like misogynistic thing they say, they could be like, okay, mum, like, yeah, they don't see you as one of, you know, the, the privileged boys anymore. They see you as like some party pooper. Yeah. And they don't want to hang out with you. Do you experience that a lot? Like a pressure where there's alarm bells going off in your brain. You're like, oh, like this is not acceptable. But like I have to work in this place. I have to come in every single day. Like my like my feelings of relaxation and acceptance here is worth more than calling this out. It is so much easier just to not say anything or just sort of go along with it. Mm. It feels a lot easier in the moment. Yeah. I mean, like, also, the thing about Todd is he's very non-confrontational. Like, he will not have a fight with anyone. And if he does, he will be the first person to apologize. Like, I can't imagine you calling somebody out, like, and just getting into... I, well, even I have a lie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I can be bothered repeating exactly what he said. So someone said something along the lines of, like, oh, if you're going, if you're going to, like, murder... A woman you'd you'd end up raping them first right what the hell this is what people <laughs> yeah. talk about at a workplace <laughs> no yeah so like so he's, he's he's trying to be a bit edgy right and you know trying to you know ra- have you seen that thing on the outrageous. internet where it's like what if cis white men weren't the devil's advocate yeah right <laughs> like, so like he says something like that just to like make us laugh at the how outrageous of a thing is to say and i'm just like fucking hell dude like how are you ever going to, like, have a job, let alone keep this job if you say things like that? <laughs> like, you know, there's other people who we don't work with and know well within earshot. You can't just say that here. What the fuck is wrong with you? So, like, you know, something like that level, I will call them out. But that's a pretty extreme level. That, yeah, yeah, that is a very high level. Yeah, right? but, like, to wait till they get to that and then to call them out. Like, do you think if you called them out, they you sort of Yeah, now they're all bitch. surprised of, like, whoa, I didn't know you... <laughs> If so you, easily insulted. If, the, if you called them out for lesser things, would that be better so they would never get to that? They'll hopefully get the message that you know, they can't talk that way around me and I don't have to listen to it. Yeah, but like I don't understand. This is something I talk about with my friends all the time. I'll say that like, you call people up on this stuff and then I'm like, why are we congratulating Todd when people shouldn't say... Like, it shouldn't be special that you're defending women or stopping this behavior like that should be the norm right yeah like you shouldn't be hoisted on everyone's shoulders parading you down the street because you're like dude is unacceptable to murder or rape women like I don't, hypothetically i don't understand. would you do both <laughs> like this is horrific like this is that 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 could fly like people actually say that in a place of work like that is horrendous <laughs> it's really it is yeah that's what i mean so like that's that's 
if that's that's what happens if you let them get away with saying you know worse and worse things you know frog in boiling water scenario yeah that's just horrific and so what happened when i reported it to this guy i went to the ceo i got an email a couple of days later ironically i was at a gender equity conference (laughs) and i get an email being like oh we should have trained you better um if you want to continue working with us you will have to jump through xyz hoops I was like, screw you. I'm not working for you anymore. What? Why? What? So instead of recognizing that that guy made me feel uncomfortable mm. and said something wrong, their solution was that, or that what came to their mind, obviously Jessie's not prepared for this work culture. We should have trained her better. And if you want to keep working with us, you need to do this, 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 and this to keep working. It was like my fault that he said this about me and that I complained. Like women are actively... Like having having opportunities taken away from them for standing up for themselves. I stood like mm. I stood up for myself and said, "Did you play mini golf? I don't get to work all year. I yeah. have to only work seasonally." I say, "Why did you let your staff member call me a bitch? Why is this a culture in your workplace? I can't go back and work for these people anymore. Like it's always the onus is on me to not be a woman. That's the that's the solution." <laughs> Can you just not be a woman and stand out? (laughs) Like, what would my life be if I was, like, a straight cis white man? I would be conquering the freaking world by now. I'd have so much energy. I wouldn't be fighting all the time for my basic rights. Like... Well, it's a little bit of just fitting in, though, as well. Like, didn't... We had a friend who worked at a retail store full of middle-aged women. And she was a younger girl... And she did not fit in well, and she got like pretty much bullied by them. She's the same age as me. Yeah. And I fit in well. Yeah. And I was not bullied by them. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes like... it's just who you are. Like that, I don't think that was a gender <laughs> thing because I had the exact same role. We were the same age. Like I don't think that's a fair gender example. But also, like I could not stand working with middle-aged women, and maybe this is also <laughs> where some of the misogyny. Like internal misogyny comes in, but I use the word oh, tactile, and they they didn't know what it meant. They thought I made up that word, and I just felt like I couldn't use my whole vocabulary around. It. <laughs> They're like, oh, just because you have a degree, you don't have to use fancy words. I think, I think tactile is a word everyone uses. Yeah. Like especially mothers. Like isn't something to do with babies? They have to have tactile experiences or like tactile play. Like, they were all mothers, so I thought that they were like that word is just a common word. But mm. I don't, this is also not a gender thing, but like, I just didn't care for. Well, that's what I was saying. Like, it's a bit of like a, you know, what sort of subculture you're in. So, like, if you're a bunch of guys who have guy talk, but also, like, if you're a bunch of young, footy, AFL loving guys, you have your own sort of like in crowd. Oh, yeah. And if someone who hates, like, football, try to hang out with them they're gonna feel like an outsider and never really be accepted by the group what is it as a men to not like sports because like i feel like that's... I, I don't care about sport at all yeah and it is a little bit of a block to like get along with people so sometimes people that you meet for the first time just assume you like sports like just oh yeah you definitely saw the game give us your opinion on this gameplay who do you barrack for oh, what a ludicrous display last night <laughs> what happens when you dismiss the sport what is it called advances like do they feel shattered inside do they not know how to communicate anymore like if if a guy comes up to you expecting that as a man you will be happy to talk about this yeah what happens then i don't know the, the, the people i hang out with they also tend to be like nerdy and nerdy people don't really care about sport but just on say average. i invite you to it's never actually been a problem for me that's what i mean well, actually... I know you're trying to put it as an example. No, when I first... When we first started dating... Oh, actually, five years actually. ago today, it was the Australian Grand Final for AFL, Australian Football League. <laughs> I know, Aussie <laughs> rules. And, it, like, there's a huge thing to celebrate the Australian uh, Football Grand Final. Like, that's a huge thing in Australia. We were at a friend's party. Footy was on. Like... At that stage, do people know you well enough that you're there as a friend just to hang out? They're not going to try and talk to you about football because that was your core friend group? Because, like, I remember we were invited to AFL party, grand final party last year, and we didn't go. 
because like yeah. you're not interested in sports there would be a whole heap of people passionate about sports yeah like is, is it just an uncomfortable situation where you're like i'm here to socialize i don't even care. care enough to like watch the grand final <laughs> and care at all about it that's how little i'm in- involved because it's so interesting like with this toxic masculinity thing inf- impacting men i had no idea about it until i was like analyzing the blogs like scientifically and i'm like how come it's not 50 50 men and women submitting blogs and then i asked the men in the group and they're like oh if we're if we talk about our feelings online we're going to get public backlash from like all the men in our lives well that's yeah you you end up sending to me a whole like sociology paper about toxic masculinity in the workplace which made me not respect sociology as much after reading it why it was a bit of like oh you know people tend to say this so it's probably true well you just said people say horrific things at work yeah no so like the the what the paper was pretty much saying is like there's a lot of like dick swinging in a lot of workplaces which leads to like people not actually getting their job done very well. Yeah. If people just stop waving their dicks around. That's true. Being like that's that's what I was interpreting toxic masculinity in the workplace to pretty I much think represent. We, we read the same paper but in very different ways. Yeah. But like I it's totally true premise, right? I without even any like real evidence I don't know how you get evidence for stuff like that. Like it it gels with what I've experienced in life. My friend studies But the way they describe it is like Ah, uh, you know, men are the worst. So the less men in a workplace, probably the better off it is. My oh, well, hang on. <laughs> my friend though studies gender differences in conservationists, and she got all these interviews. She told me about one where a guy in an office punched a woman, the wall next to a woman's head, made a hole in the wall next to her head. He didn't get fired. He didn't even get a warning. Yeah. Like, how is this acceptable that in some places, like, you are fearing for your life and the man gets, like, no, like, nothing. No reprimanding. What's, like, the past tense of reprimand? Reprimansion? <laughs> well, yeah. So, like, the people at my workplace who are, like, so you've murdered a lady. What are you <laughs> you're, like, you're all in anyway. What else do you do? They, they are the type of people who will be, like, oh. Can you believe it? You get fired for saying the wrong thing at work. How ridiculous is that? But like, that's not the case, is it? People do awful things and not get fired. Like, they should be. Yeah, I've been in workplaces. If you punch a wall, like, obviously, you can't work here anymore, dude. How many workplaces have I had to leave because I've been, like, like, mentally manipulated or psychologically abused? And I've just had to leave. Or yeah, like instead people... of like fixing the problem or firing the people who are the problem. They just fire the victim. Yeah. Or let the victims like, oh, I'm sick of this. I'm just going to leave them. Yeah. Like it fosters a culture where it's like an uninhabitable environment for either women or even men who are victims to toxic masculinity. Yeah. Like that's, ho- that's so bad. That's so horrific. Yeah. <laughs> I can't it's definitely a thing. Like, and what makes it weird for me is that those people at your work have partners. Like, to think that, like, either there's, like, they have a different persona when they're around them, and then they bitch about them behind their back, or they're, like, actively like that to their face and they put up with it. I don't know what's worse. <laughs> <laughs> like, how are these yeah, people... Right. How can they say such, hor- like, horrible things about women, but also, like want to be with one and one of them said my girlfriend wants me to propose to her well, i don't know why <laughs> like, <laughs> why, why would she want to be with this guy forever anyway he said i refuse until she loses weight like what the hell like this is horrifying to think that i could be with a man who will say stuff like this like it, it's what, what are they they chalk it up as like you know boys locker room talk yeah, but this is the problem where when I was growing up, it was always like, I could I had to be the bigger person. Like, my brother could do anything to me. He could use, like, physical violence. He used to, sh- like, hide the TV remote down his pants. 
It was always like... <laughs> that's not really physical violence. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying that's physical violence. But he could like own the whole living room and be like the living room dictator. He yeah. could choose the whole... He would be a little shit. Yeah. As little brothers and are. And then it's always boys will be boys. Yeah, but you use verbal like attacks. So he rebuts with physical attacks because his verbal capacity is not like He yours. is stupider than you. Like, it's so frustrating that when you're a kid, especially as a sister, an older sister... You have to always bend yourself because there's always boys will be boys. Yeah. Like that is a horrific thing to grow up with. That whatever you're feeling is never as important as like the stereotypical actions of your brother. Yeah. Like you have to grow up feeling scared for your life. So now you just normalize that. As yeah. Like, you know, if a, if a guy acts really stupidly and aggressively... That's fine. I grew up with it. You know, that's just them being themselves. Yeah. But it's up to me to... Deal with it. Deal with it. I have to push my feelings aside. I have to be the bigger person. I acknowledge that I'm probably, like, verbally superior. So he has the privilege of combating my words with his violence. That doesn't make you feel better about it afterwards, though, does it? No. (laughs) It's all, like, excuses. And, like, we shouldn't be making excuses for men to treat women like this. Yeah. Like, I... Like, just thinking about, like, the small misogynistic traits that I've had to grow, grow up with that have shaped how I think about myself and the people around me that like it's it's fine to live in fear around men like that's normal it's okay you should always be scared that's like how you should live like what is this like society is so corrupt <laughs> <laughs> yes it is <laughs> uh, let's burn it down <laughs> I mean, back to the conservation perspective, like, as we said before, I've often been in really It's the same islands. society problems, but exacerbated. Yeah, exacerbated, because I've been in remote locations with people in different cultures. So, like, when I was living in Indonesia, like, women aren't respected as much anyway. Oh, we haven't even gone into all of that. But... Yeah, I know. And, like, in... Like, when I was living in Madagascar, there's people from all over the world. So maybe there's different cultural stigmas about gender that are, like, I don't even know about that have been inflicted onto me. There's, like, so much going on because you're in the middle of nowhere. There's all these other stresses and you're just trying to stay alive. You're trying to stay healthy. You're trying to do your job. And at the same time, there's either, like, um, sexist pressure in your environment academically, like, going back to my supervisor, you can never get anywhere without using my name. Like, he never expected me as a young woman working underneath him to make anything positive in the world, like, any notable contributions. Like, that wasn't even... He explicitly told me that. And I don't know if he would have told that to a man. I always assumed he was sort of, like, stuck in his little corner of academia. Like, me as a guy for street, I don't know, I've never heard that guy's name. Like, he's nothing to me. Yeah. He's but not- he must think he's, like, the big shot. Yeah. In, like, this little subset. I sometimes think academia is like that. It's like you read papers, and then you see names coming up all the time, and if you are one of those names, you're like, people assume my name come up all the time. Like they're- I've heard there's a lot of weird drama about, like, whose name is on a paper and what order in it's what in order? and stuff. Exactly. Like, Which, strangely. You're, like, what's, like, just, you're the Hugh Grant if your, like, name is first. And Don't like <laughs> fa- famous scientists. They all put their name on a paper, but they had like nothing to do with it. Yeah, like all the like you know undergrad uni students are the everything. one who did all the work, they and then he just slaps their name on it. Yeah, shit. That's a bit stupid. That's like a whole other thing. That's like just academia, but like that yeah. is a good example for how it is kind of in the world. Like if I do something, and then somebody else comes along, oh yeah, it was my idea. Like, yeah. you know how, like, okay, this is, this is <laughs> another thing. So Todd and I are going to get married next year. And even mm. I was like, I was talking with the celebrant about the vows and like the, the whole, like, what is it called? The like itinerary of the wedding. Yeah. He sent me back like a draft of what he thought would be good. Well, we, hang on the background. We're, we're not like super religious oh, and yeah. take this as like a serious ceremony. So we told him like, you know, happy to have, you know, jokes, you know, whatever you want to say. Be a bit jovial. This is know, like a fun time. It. Like this is after COVID, hopefully. That we just want a yeah. big party. Like we want a big celebration. A big party celebration, not so much like a somber, you know, event that everyone's crying at. We're not very like traditional people in the slightest and our wedding is gonna be like a festival. It's not gonna be 
any i'm not even wearing white like it's not <laughs> it's not traditional yeah so we've told him that and he comes back with oh he he started off with some thing like oh no it was at the end it's like remember todd if jesse's right praise her and if if no if jesse's right like uh, beg for forgiveness and yeah if she's wrong don't say anything up. Like, what the hell? It's like setting the standard that in our the whole rest of our lives together, Todd has to just be submissive and, like, everything I say is, like, good and if he has a differing opinion, who freaking cares? Like, it sets that standard that nothing Todd does. This is, like, reverse sexism almost. <laughs> <laughs> the stereotype that, like... If you picture, like, a sitcom like Homer and Marge, like, Homer's the dumb one. You know, every, every husband is the dumb one. And every wife is, like, the smart one who has to do everything. It's, like, so... I was, like, crying after this because there was so much misogyny in this. And I was, like, I can't believe I'm putting so much time, money, and effort into a celebration of love between, like, me and someone I really care about. And it's been projected as this, like, slave master ownership. (laughs) Where, like, one of us always has to silently suffer. Like, why are you getting into marriages when it's... Like, oh, the ball and chain. Why are you legally entering into a marriage that is suffering? Yeah. Like, why is that a stereotype? Why is this acceptable? Do not say on our wedding day that we are going to be living a life of having to hide our feelings, having our speech restricted, having all these toxic traits thrust upon us, and have it as a lighthearted joke in front of all our family and friends, setting yeah. that as a precedent of how they can talk to us. So I I didn't, like, this is the kind of thing of, like, a, I was in too much shock to say anything. So instead <laughs> of being like, what the hell, I just erased everything that I didn't like and like wrote yeah, like, my no, own how thing. about this instead yeah but then I'm like how many other people is he saying this to and thinking it's okay and I'm just I felt like kind of responsible for not saying like not speaking up and saying like how dumb it's 2020 you can't talk like this I could imagine some wise being like yeah that's right you better shut up bitch well is that See, this is like the stereotype that's wrong. Like, we yeah. shouldn't even be assuming that people talk like that because he assumed that I do, yeah, and I yeah, don't. Yeah. So we shouldn't even be saying that there's some people. That's been interesting the whole time. We've been do organizing stuff for the wedding, and the like the oh the food people, the caterers. I was gonna say like the who who was the name of them, just in general. Who or oh, like vendors? Vendors, I guess. Yeah, the people we trying to get services from they will talk to both of us initially and then they'll pretty much always just end up talking to you jesse and be like well listen it's your big day you know how do you really want it even when i and like, it's, you know obviously it's say, just sort of like assume that like i don't really have an input into it and even when i explicitly say like i cut them off and say no it's our day like we are doing this together it's a two-person relationship they always say yes yes of course but what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> like, they don't even listen. It's like they put the stereotype of what men and women marriages have to be mm. above what I actually am telling them to their face. Yeah, but if they're wedding vendors, you know, they talk to couples all the time. Like, and there must be a, a hint of truth behind But they are assumptions. enforcing it. Like, the, the fact is that, it, like, there's nothing against people who want a traditional wedding. I'm not saying that, like, it is beautiful if you want to get married in a church, it's religious, you have the big white dress, you have bouquets of flowers, like, that is perfectly fine if it makes Mm. you happy. But you can't just assume that every woman fits that stereotype, because I don't. And I'm telling this, like, I, I give you all this information to your face, and I'm very blunt, and I say explicitly, I want this, this, and this. This is, like, how it is. Yeah. And they say, yes, but... Well, that's just sort of bad salesmanship at that point. You're not understanding what the client wants and trying to make your thing fit. And it's like, it's, I guess the worst part is I take this very personally because it's like I'm being disregarded or being stereotyped. It doesn't really phase you at all. Like it, I'm not, I'm not bothered. Yeah, you're not bothered by it, but it's such, it's such a struggle even by other women. It's such a strong stereotype. I think, would you say it's, it's a real thing? Girls growing up think about their wedding day more than boys growing up. 
I'm not sure, actually. Because I'm not sure. It's, it's assumed it's, that it's it is, It's a stereotype. Right? Exactly. But there's so many people I know in relationships where the man cares about weddings and having kids and the woman is so career orientated and i think now it's socially acceptable for women to have like big careers that the Mm. men are starting to take that role of like hey but i'm the one that wants a family and women are like oh but maybe i don't maybe i want to be a big powerful boss yeah so i'm seeing that more and more in relationship dynamics but you have to understand where in australia like there's things that like we see in our bubble in our culture that may not necessarily apply to other parts in the world like it might still be very surely traditional um but even like my friend in indonesia she's like what if i don't want to get married i like she's very old now she's like our age like 27 28 oh. <laughs> oh no she's actually maybe in her 30s but she's like way past the indonesian prime to get married but she's like people in her life can't understand that that's not her life goal is to be owned by a man <laughs> <laughs> Like, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, there's certainly, like, yeah, places in the world where it's a bit just straight up horrifyingly, oh, yep, you're now 14, time to get married off to uh, this person so they will pay our families some money for you. I keep... Like, that happens, right? This is why I'm so adamant about the wedding not being misogynistic is I don't want it to be, like, I'm getting palmed off for goats. Yeah. Like, a lot of weddings is about the women being traded for goats. (laughs) <laughs> like every part of like even the bouquet of like who's next rubs me the wrong way yeah. <laughs> like okay this person's done something that's an independent decision for them like but now everybody follows suit like which woman is they never chuck the bouquet to the man it's like the women <laughs> fight over who's going to be like so that's saying stereotype women care about weddings and men don't <sighs> so the Worst thing I've ever seen. Even though I'm the one asking. Yeah, you. I'm the one that's keen. the worst part. Is that <laughs> well. you, the men are the one to ask, and the women are expected to plan everything and do all the work. Like <laughs> yeah. it's bullshit. Anyway, the worst thing I've ever <laughs> seen is I. I went to a wedding in Indonesia, um, a Javanese wedding, I think, and the woman had to wash the men's feet in this the ceremony part of the ceremony part yeah. of the ceremony i was sitting there looking around is anybody else did the guy wash the lady's feet no because well, they, it's I mean, a representation it's like a visual metaphor that she will serve him for the rest of their days together she will wash his feet like, yeah oh i was looking around like is anyone else weirded out by this just me this tall white woman in the back of the wedding like i did vomit for like a week after i did have food poisoning but also because of that really like we... even like um you don't want i think normally the the father would walk the bride down the aisle oh yeah my dad is not walking and down the aisle you you just like find that horrific of like just the metaphor of Trading uh, i'm me. owned by my dad and now he's literally handed me off to a new man to own me. Oh, like straight weddings are like so Like you love disgusting. your dad. I do love my dad. And like it would be sweet to lay like, hold hands, but like <laughs> Just the metaphor, what the symbolism. Straight weddings are really disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to anyone that's got married and his final law of this. This is obviously just my personal opinion. I'm not trying to reflect that everybody should do this, but it just yeah. rubs me the wrong way that this really ancient misogynistic tradition is getting carried on to now and then subtly bits of it, not even subtly, like very obviously bits are still in there. It just... <laughs> it's it a is, hot issue for this. It, it is a hot issue for me because even it's hard to explain this to people like my friends and family who I explicitly say like what my values are of like why I'm getting married and why I'm doing all of this. Yeah. And but they still have this notion of the stereotype in their brain and they can't understand like that their notion of what marriage is is not exactly what the experience that I want. What yours is, yeah. Yeah. Which is I feel like weddings especially in today's what well, in a, in today's australia at least as far as i know they're very different for different people yeah it's not like there's a set oh you have to do this and have to do this and have this in the ritual yeah nothing people like, can just do what they want really they can but there's an expectation and the expectations are like so ingrained in us that i'm going to a wedding it will be like this like for instance we said it's festival theme where whatever you want crazy 
Mm. And then Todd's mom is going to wear a tutu, like a bright pink tutu. We're like, yes. And we tell people this and their first reaction is like, oh, shit. Like, are you going to tell her? Like, no, we want you to dress like this as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, just have fun. Like, let loose. All these fools wearing tuxedos. <sighs> and it's just like, it's interesting to hear the celebrant talk about how he's had to adapt the ceremonies for different parts, like for new couples, how there's a lot of like gay couples, lesbian couples. Um, coming through and they don't walk down an aisle some if it's two men he's heard have them like walk in from each side to the altar like and now with um freedom of gender expression of sexuality people are taking these ceremonies into their own hands and it's so amazing to see the possibilities of how people can represent their love and showcase it but it's just a bit shit where even i'm like straight people have so much privilege i'm not like knocking that i'm hyper aware but just, like, damn, straight people have it bad in weddings. <laughs> just in <laughs> weddings, we don't have. We're even... allowed to have them in the first place. <laughs> yeah, this is this is really bad of me to say because, like, in a lot of countries, it's still illegal for gay people to get married. Like, yeah. that's straight up. I am privileged to be able to have a wedding, but I feel like it's so amazing that if you are privileged enough to have a wedding and you are a gay couple, and you get to choose whatever you want and because there's no preconceived notions of what your wedding should be from millennia people Mm. are so accepting and loving of what you choose to do on your wedding day there's no preconceived stereotypes of what has to happen in that ceremony yeah we're definitely i think we're both very sympathetic to a lot of gay people who like you you might take the opinion of our weddings are just you know sexist uh you know, disgusting traditional things. You know, if you're a progressive gay couple, why even have a wedding? But I think we can understand, like, you you know, it's really, it still feels nice to have a celebration and a somewhat formal expression of a relationship. Especially if you've survived being with Todd for, like, five years. You want to, like, <laughs> celebrate it a bit. Like, I can endure anything. <laughs> can put up with me. But I think, yeah, people deserve to be able to celebrate their love. And even in Indonesia, I was so scared to hold hands with Todd. Like, I could get arrested for holding hands with him. So A lewd display. There's, like, so, some messed up stuff in my brain about what's possible in a relationship. And I think, for me, like, being able to publicly showcase love with someone is a real privilege. And having lived in countries where I've seen the weddings and the feet washing and be, like having been owned by a man and being traded and like I acknowledge that being able to have the freedom of a westernized wedding is a huge privilege. Mm. And the only reason why I'm picking it to pieces so much is because of the ways that it still is still nasty. <laughs> like it's still not really it shouldn't be acceptable to have like celebrants legally been able to make these comments to you and it shouldn't be illegal for them to have sexist jokes yeah like we're in 2020 like come on (laughs) (laughs) and i think like now is a good time to we're so open we're celebrating so many people's love like you don't have to conform to um like any kind of like you can be whoever you want and that's amazing and actually what i heard from someone or like saw in a documentary or i've seen somewhere People who are non-binary get less sexism in the office because there's no preconceived stereotypes about the way people should act towards them. So in a mm. way, in um, in offices where they use all uh, non-gendered language, then women speak up more, like statistically significantly more, yeah. and have more of the floor and their opinions are more represented when there is no gendered language used at all in the office which i thought was really crazy that like just we're impacted so much by stereotypes that if you come in as somebody that has no preconceived stereotypes attached to you is so liberating and you get to create all this freedom for everyone around you and that's amazing well they're still doing all these studies that just highlight how sexist even like the most progressive countries with like laws against it like what was it they had uh, resumes and they just gave all the names like man names mm-hmm. the most skilled person got the job but if they had like women names they tended to get ranked lower 
Yeah, and like, what's going on there? So th- there's one that they took off all the names. No names. Yeah, no names at all. Just applicant one and two. Yeah, and then the women are ranked way higher than if their actual names were on there. Yeah, like this, you know, it's still a thing everywhere. And even that comes back to the internalized misogyny because in those trials, they got the people at the table to discuss the resumes, and even the women were like, "Oh, I think that guy will be more suitable for this job. I think he'll be smarter." like there's just like this is what I'm saying like it's still a problem even for women to have these notions of how society views you and then we subtly pass that on in our own language and behaviour and it's just crazy for me because like as I was saying with this lonely conservationist example I thought by actively campaigning for conservationist rights by working with people who consider themselves to be lonely conservationists to put myself in these open like aligning um, positions that it would be different but it wasn't and I think that <laughs> that says a lot that like and even like somebody else in the incubator program uh, who called himself a lonely conservationist s- distributed widely a document saying that I would be working for him without asking my permission first in as somebody who has seen me on my journey as someone who had understood lonely conservationists and everything that I was fighting for and who even called himself a lonely conservationist still went and submitted a document saying he basically had ownership of me and my services without even consulting me about it and you reckon he probably would be much less likely to do that to a guy well I don't know maybe maybe he's just a bit assuming of people this is like maybe not like I don't know if it's a sexism thing but it's like I had blatantly like he knew I was fighting for conservationist rights like you can Mm. tell people as much of your values and your rights as you want but it doesn't necessarily reflect their actions you know yeah that's my problem is that I've been such an advocate for this and this is why I'm still talking about this is why I wrote it in the book this is why I'm talking about it now is I think we just have to do everything we can to be brave enough even though I hate that we shouldn't it's not being brave like but I guess we have to because sometimes like nobody listens to you and you feel unsafe and vulnerable and I guess you do have to be brave and call this out because it has to stop like I deserve rights as much as Todd deserves rights as much as any of you deserve rights yeah it's true (laughs) (laughs) and I think like I hope you understand the power of this being in the blogs like I understand not a lot of some people have written about being sexually harassed and sexism in the blogs and I hope you understand that um it's not for nothing like the amount that we highlight this as being normal is like helping to spark the conversation I guess like me too that is so prevalent and that we actually do have to do things about it like you know mm. that in ANU, I think, how a girl was raped and nobody listened to her. So she just carted a mattress around every day until like the laws changed in her university or like the rules changed in her university. So everyone just knew her. Vaguely remember that. Everyone just knew her as this. I, I think the it was ANU, lady. I'm not sure. But like it's such an obvious statement to be like, oh, why is she carrying a mattress around? Like, But it's, it's also... It's bringing right. attention to something. Yeah. And then people have to do something. But it's so shit that like people don't take her word. She has to carry a mattress around for something to change. Yeah. Obviously, I'm very angry about it's, all of this. It's like it with, makes me, with good reason. It makes me fume. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, in conclusion... I love it. anything wedding-related where you'll get mad about these sort of, like, you know, subtle sexism things. You'll get angry about it, and then they'll just assume you're being a bridezilla. Yeah! That's the freaking double standard. Is that like you can't do anything? You either shut up and accept the sexism, or you contest it, and you're fitting in with the stereotype. Like no wonder bridezillas are a thing. It's because people are just trying to stand up for themselves. <laughs> it's not like it's not I funny. Think there's, there's an element of that. Just you know, with people in the normal workplaces, if you stand up for yourself, you're seen as like a troublemaker. Yeah. Like, oh, now we have to deal with this hassle just because, you know, you care about it because it happened to you. <laughs> I feel like that when I started Lonely Conservationist, I felt like I was going to be run out of town for you get speaking backlash. Up. Yeah. I still feel like that. And I think, like... Well, you still... You tried to contact conservationist uh, organizations and say, hey, 
you know, I'm I'm got my finger on the pulse of you know the mental issues and problems conservationists face. Um, do you want me to like help your employees and like you know make sure it's a more open environment, everyone gets the support they need? And they came back to you like, nah, we're all good. No one here has any problems. We me. love our jobs. This is, is this sexism? How men don't listen? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. Maybe you should tell the story. That didn't happen to me. That happened to a, a person that I know who runs a helpline for wildlife carers who tried to submit a mental health uh, survey to wildlife caring organizations. Uh. And they were saying there's no mental health issues. Yeah. I'm like I haven't bothered to to do the anything similar with conservation organizations <laughs> because basically I'm scared of like if I talk so publicly about things ways I've been impacted in the industry I don't it like makes me feel like I will be less respected. It's a bit you're trying to highlight problems and hey guys we should fix this but it's a bit of bit of a messaging problem of like now you're just the enemy of a lot of the organizations because you're just the one pointing out problems I guess like there's, there's a good thing you're still passionate about conservationists and they're still doing good work but you're just trying to highlight issues yeah just which makes them, them think that you're just bad news and i think this is like lonely conservationist has not really been successful on linkedin since writing the book and having the title how to conserve conservationists it's been very popular because it's like um a so- more solution based Mm. And I try to be solution based. I think lonely conservationists, their name occurred because I was lonely in that time. I just thought it would be me sharing one blog. I never expected it to blow up. But having. You didn't have solutions at the time at all. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I was just sad. <laughs> but now that I have like the book and this podcast called How to Conserve Conservationists, and at the end of each chapter, I'm like, if you see a wild conservationist, blah, 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 like give tips to help you be more empathetic and understanding to what they're going through. I think that's what people are looking for is solution based. Uh, if you have a problem, make sure you can fix it. Which is like shit because it's recognize the problem to begin with. It's not our fault to like. It's not our problem to fix. It's not my problem to fix sexism. Like <laughs> because I'm a victim to it, it's not my responsibility to fix it. Like that's. And you're just gonna make the most noise about the problem because you're facing it. In the in these papers, right? In these sociology papers, they say men expect the minorities to fix the problems they're facing. So if there's like disabled people, women complaining about how they're being treated by men, men expect that it's on the disabled person, the woman, the transgender, the non-binary to change or to fix the problem rather yeah. than the men who are causing the problem. I don't know why that makes me think... I went used to go to like an obstacle course gym where instead of just lifting weights up and down again, you'd like climb right everything, like hamster. monkey bars, yeah, <laughs> hamster it up. And there was one guy there who was in a wheelchair and he was better than me at like every obstacle. Like he brought the chair with him. And like mm-hmm. dude was mad. And... It's, it's very admirable to see that, right? Mm-hmm. Be like, oh, okay, you know, you can't use your legs, but you put in, like, a 200% effort to overcome that. But, like, you're, that's, I think that's what a lot of guys think about when, like, when you said minorities need to fix it. Like, oh, they just need to man up and, you know, overcome the issues. They just need to get really buff arms so they can monkey bar with their wheelchair as well. Yeah, like, or alternatively, we could just subtly change society to have, like, ramps for people in wheelchairs to make it easier for them. And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, God, that's going to not even slightly inconvenience me, but, like, I, can't, I don't want to deal with the change that makes it easier for everyone. They should just man up and overcome the stairs. That reminds me. That's, of I think that's sort of the attitude. The Trump Biden presidential debate. Everyone was complaining, like two white men just arguing about stuff that doesn't even impact them, defending white supremacy, <laughs> uh, people who aren't poor, or white, like all these really ho- ho- like horrible things. And it's like there's no like these are the people running yeah. the world, like America's. Um, president determines how the rest of the world gets treated basically yeah like there's such power and it's all just straight white men and that's crazy like that's why jacinda bless her soul new zealand is thriving because of jacinda (laughs) we love jacinda everyone wishes they're in new zealand with jacinda and like even like i don't want to get too political but like we had a, a female prime minister for like a year and a half or something like just didn't even make full term she got bullied out by men well, she was a snake. What do you mean? 
She, there was a whole Australian... Dr- We're not going to go into politics, but basically, like, it's really challenging for women to take... Australian leadership. politics have not been stable ever since. <laughs> it's really challenging for women to take leadership positions because, like, she had, like, a pointy nose and red hair and people would just, like, characterise and just make yeah. fun of her for things that had nothing to do with her leadership, her policies. She would face so many criticisms that... Like, even... The Americans, I think there was some uh, left-wing lady politician in America who put down, like, $250 for her hair, for, like, a public appearance or something, like, to see a hairstylist, and, like, oh, can you believe women? $250, a taxpayer money to make her hair look nice. Yeah, men. But then, like, Trump's taxes (laughs) get shown, and Trump spends $70,000 for his hair. For a TV show. Oh my god. And it's like... God. What? This is <laughs> Double like, standard. I'm just going to end with one... Like, just a funny thing. Is when I first ever went over Todd's house, he declared to me very confidently that all women wear makeup. And I'm like, I'm not wearing makeup right now. Like, I don't wear makeup. And he proceeded to touch my face because he did not believe me. You were just too pretty. Oh. <laughs> but there's just like some like subtle things where like if men grow up or like boys grow up and they just think women a hundred percent of the time wear makeup, that he didn't even believe my face was real. So it's just like very weird, bizarre things. I I know women who d- don't leave the house without makeup. Yeah, but that's not all women. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so I guess in conclusion. I could talk about this for the next 10 years if you want a whole other podcast just on sexism, like the whole yeah. the whole theme of it. It's a like whole series. Jesse's sexism rants. Yes. Like, I could. I could talk about it for 10 years. Let's do it. <laughs> um, but in conclusion, people are, they can't choose the body they're in. So if you're like male, female, trans, non-binary, you're born into the the way that you're born. So we should just be nicer to each other because it's not like we chose to be like this and we shouldn't be disadvantaged because of who we are or like what body we have and then going back to the chapter title of what's in your field pants shouldn't matter Mm. um so i i urge you if you're a todd and you you work (laughs) at an office and there's small misogynistic things that get said every now and again maybe stand up for ones that aren't so so horrific like the little microaggressions let's just uh, like highlight them we need to start somewhere and they they end up defining the culture yeah and their office by the way got really horrible in the culture testing and the culture training as you can imagine we actually measured our culture and it's not great it's not good uh we we need to fix culture um if you're a woman check your internalized misogyny because like it's not cool to be (laughs) One like I'm not like the other girls. Every girl is strong and powerful, and everyone is valid. We need to be start like we need to stop shaming women for being into makeup or wanting a traditional wedding or for having like the like stereotypical girly lifestyle. Like that is fine. You can live like that. Just and you, be yourself. You shouldn't be penalized for that. Like we need to just check ourselves and just make sure that everyone feels safe and comfortable because it's so challenging to be in a remote field with people who are kind of strangers who maybe like 10 times the physical strength of you and feel safe Mm. and like i'm not even the most disadvantaged like i could be trans or non-binary and really fearing for my life and i already fear for my life but that could be like tenfold um so we just we need to start working together to create these safe spaces, even for men. Toxic masculinity shouldn't impact you so much. Like, you are men. Work together. Sort your shit out. Help each other out. If a man writes a blog, comment, oh my god, amazing. Like, I'm, I'm here for you, man. Like, just start sticking up for each other more. I'm totally aware that was the longest podcast we have ever done and that is because look we could just talk about sexism forever so if you have parts of the conversation you want to add 
please keep the conversation going amongst your friends and family. I think this is a hugely important topic to talk about. And to hear many different people's perspectives, head over to the blog at lonelyconservationist.com. Check us out on Instagram at Lonely Conservationist, Twitter at Lonely Conserve, and if you want to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lonelyconservationist. And don't forget, grab yourself a book, follow along with the stories that I wrote down but didn't talk about in the podcast. And until then, I see you guys next week. Thank you.